Hi, everyone. This is the sixth session of the July 2023 Florida Bar Crash Course. And today we are going to be looking over previous torts essays and as a class identifying as many issues as possible. Some things I discussed with the class before we started the recording was what it takes to have a strong essay. And for me, my grading system is 40 is passing, 50 is good, 60 is great, 70 is grand, and 80 is wonderful. And the first thing is length. We're looking for 2,000 words or 10,000 characters. That's a good length to shoot for. If you write an essay under 1,000 or 1,500 words, it's pretty much impossible that you're going to pass. Um, furthermore, if you wrote a failing essay in your folder, I'd prefer that you rewrite it, and I'll go ahead and grade that one, and that way you'll get in the habit of how to write strong essays. So remember, it's still the beginning of the course. We're all doing amazing. Um, if you're here, that's amazing because 90% of life is showing up. And I explained to the class, the more active participation, the better. And we had a student explain that there's a button you can press and you can change your name if you wanna be incognito. Whatever you wanna do, I just encourage participation. So if we look at the um, calendar, you can see that we're doing the Torch Workshop. We should feel confident about writing contracts essays and torts essays. I had one student write such a good essay that I called her out. And I was like, I don't know if this was written under time circumstances. She said that it was, and that what helped her was the questionnaires and memorizing those questionnaires. So I, I can't stress that enough. That's really helpful. Um, today, we're going to do the torts workshop. And what that's going to consist of is going through the previous torts essays and issue spotting. Issue spotting is the key to this all, right? So if we go to the materials folder, we go to the torts folder, and we go to the Florida torts official essays, we can, uh, we can look at some. I'll make sure too that we'll look at the one that was um, administered in February, 2023, which we've talked about the cookies and Aunt Martha and the whole wedding fiasco. All right, does anyone have a year in particular that calls to them? And you have to tell me why. I could go first. All right, let's do 2008. That's the year I graduated high school. Anyone else graduate 2008? High school? I'm among none of my peers. Okay. So I like to read the call to question first. Um, someone in the chat. 2001. Okay. Um, Betty and Fran have requested that your firm represent both of them. You have been asked to prepare a memo discussing the poss possible causes of actions and defenses. To me, this is beautiful. This is a torch essay at its finest, right? It's like two people and it forces you to think about both sides and it just wants us to throw the kitchen sink of causes of action, right? I want us to get creative as possible and then defenses. Um, what are some defenses to torch we can just think of off the bat that we think probably are gonna come in this essay? Consent. I'm sorry, what was that? Consent. Consent, okay, that's potential. What else? Um, Self-defense. Self-defense, assumption of risk, defense of others. Okay, anything else? Maybe statute of limitations, potentially. Um, we said consent, defense of others, assumption of risk, statute of limitations. Uh, those are some good ones. Maybe privilege, right? Lack of intent, lack of duty. Sure, maybe privilege. But um, let's go paragraph by paragraph and let's issue spot. And I want everyone to understand that every word has a purpose. I really believe it's like poetry. You know, it could be, you want to look at every word and say, why did the writer write this word? So Betty went to health food store and asked an employee for assistance with the selection of herbal remedies. Carl, the cashier, was not assigned to that section, had not been trained in its inventory, and had been specifically told by his employer not to give advice about the products. Nonetheless, he told Betty that he was all about herbal medicine. Betty said that she had never used any herbs and wanted him to recommend a remedy for arthritis. Carl gave her a bottle of power pills and told her they were great for arthritis. I have a necklace that they should consider. Okay, so what issues does anyone spot here? Um, respondent superior, superior. I don't know if it's like an issue, but. Yeah, absolutely. I like that. Respondent superior. Um, then... What is respondent superior? Like here, they're going to say, I'm sure it's going to go to like, if the employer is going to be held liable, but 
probably won't because it was out of the scope of employee. An employee employer that kind of gave us that idea of vicarious liability and um, responding superior Omar saying agency theory, right? Good, good buzzword. Anything else? I see someone said negligence. What do you think about negligence? Uh, Scarlett. Like the duty um, of the employee um, mm -hmm. and his and his actual knowledge. So failure to like actually do or have the proper training. Um, 100%. So, we're, yeah. definitely, we're definitely going to have negligence here. It's towards its negligence. Is it going to be premise liability? Is it going to be what Omar said, some type of misrepresentation? It seems that there was a misrepresentation of some sort because he did say that he knew all about um, herbal medicine. We think that's going to bring up representation. Um, let's kind of go through it slower. So he asked an employee for assistance with the selection of herbal remedies. So that's vicarious liability, employer, employee, who is not assigned, had not been trained in its inventory. What is that? Had not been trained in its inventory? So if he haven't, he hasn't been trained in this inventory. We don't rate we we raise the duty, but we don't reduce it, right? There's a there's a lot. Of, well, you're so thinking we of them to a reasonable person standard in that in that case. I, right? I I would love to say when you're issue spotting, don't get too conclusory. Just exactly like Barbara's saying, I want that negligent hiring, negligent training. You know, just issue spot. Don't make conclusions. You know, we don't know what's going on and we're going to argue both sides. I'm not saying don't make conclusions. Your mind is obviously going to jump to conclusions, but try to just issue spot. I'd say negligent training, negligent hiring, right? The employer is doing something. And we talked about vicarious liability and responding superior. Um, he had been specifically told by his employer, so not to give advice about the product. So what does that kind of implicate? A breach of a duty um between the employer and the employee sure but that's probably not going to be the the causes of action here what i, I think of um with respondent superior that um the frolic versus the um detour and whether yeah. that would be assessed as a more of a frolic since it's specifically told not to okay so i'm not going to say <clears throat> it's a frolic or a detour but i'm going to put those words down in my issue spotting because those are nice those are tasty words and yeah, I, I'm with you. Like, there's something about it. Like, it seems that um, he was told not to give advice about the products. What I would say, would that potentially cut off liability in the vicarious liability chain, right? Is that some sort of intervening, superseding, like the employee did something he was specifically told not to do? My argument would, yeah, he's just saying no. My argument would probably be that because, uh, it's foreseeable within the scope of his, of his employment duties, it probably would not cut off liability. But still, we would want to talk about it. A lot of, to talk about. He knew all about herbal medicine. That's kind of the representation, the warranty maybe. Um, is someone saying, is he still in control of, is he still in control of employer? I don't know what you in mean. The sense, in the sense of like, that it wouldn't cut, cut off the liability because the employer is still like, um, in control yeah, of the employee's it's, actions. It is still within the scope of business. That's the proper way of interpreting that. Yes, it is still within the scope of business. So Betty said that she had never used any herbs and wanted to recommend a remedy for arthritis. So she wanted to recommend a remedy for arthritis and he gave her a bottle of power pills and told her they were a great remedy for arthritis. What is this? I'm looking for something here. What are power pills? It's a product, but it's, it's going to be product liability, but we still have product liability facts. And then what is this? They're great for arthritis. Fitness for a particular purpose? Fitness for a particular purpose. You're literally saying these power pills are fit for the particular purpose of arthritis. You're getting smoked right here with the whole, I mean, not smoked, but I'm just saying like, there's a whole products liability case here. There's express warranties, there's implicit warranties. Now we're talking about products liability. We're talking about negligence. We're talking about responding at superior. We're talking about negligent hiring, negligent training. We're talking about whether um, uh, liability was cut off because of the employee acting outside the scope. We're talking about a lot of stuff, right? That's why I'm saying 750 word essays are not gonna cut it because I could write 750 words about this paragraph. 
but I don't have time. I have, I have one hour, right? So we got to hone that skill. That's why you need to practice writing essays. That's the number one. People ask me, what's the number one indicator of who passes and who fails? And it's the number of practice essays they wrote under time conditions, without a doubt. Um, okay. The label on power pills identified them as a food supplement designed to give an energy boost. The label included a list of herbal ingredients and a recommended dose of one pill three times a day. Power pills are manufactured by Herbco. Okay, this express warranty, definitely. We're just kind of adding to what we already deduced from the first paragraph. There's warranties involved. These are all warranties. Um, Manufacturers, so like the chain of liability. So I want someone out there to, to participate. I was talking in the class about how I'm the top participant in my NIL class right now. Who can tell me what is a product's liability claim? What does it entail specifically manufacturing defect and design defect? How would you define them? Manufacturing would be that one product is like not to the standards of all the other products. Sure. One product came off the line differently. That's fair enough. And then design defect. Not sure. What do we, how do we know if there's a design defect? Someone else. Oh, design, design. Oh, sorry. Go ahead. Oh, no. It's... <laughs> Go ahead. It's fine. A design defect would be all of the products come out funky because the way it was designed was not done properly. How do we know if it was not done properly, Barbara? Um, I ever like every product would be would come out shitty. I mean, I, I don't know. No, 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 I like that. I like that. Shitty is a good word in your <laughs> office to your friend. How are we going to test it on the bar exam? What would we need? Safer. There are safer alternatives. About we, what would we, what, what are we doing right here? Um, it's a utility test. Thank you, Lexi. Can you explain that to the class? Um, it's the risk of like the, I'm trying to think of the way to actually explain it. Um, it there's cheaper ways to do the exact same thing, but, or there's like a little bit more expensive, but it's gonna be way better to everyone and be safer. Right, in measuring whether there's a design defect, the courts will look at if the risk caused by designing it that way was outweighed by the utility of designing it that way. And one way to certainly tell is if there was an alternative way of designing it that was safer and not more expensive, then it's a design defect, right? And they could have designed it for the same price or cheaper and it was less dangerous than that's typically a design defect. But it's a balancing test. You wanna measure the risk of making it that dangerous versus utility of making it that dangerous. So we have design defect is when like Barbara so eloquently put, they're all made shitty, or we have manufacturing defect when one is made shitty. When Tommy, you know, takes a smoke break when he was supposed to, you know, put the widgets together, right? One of them's differently. So we have a great uh, products defect case. Um, I'm sorry, products liability case. One of my favorite highbrow statements to make, and I'm telling you, highbrow statements are are good on the bar exam. You want to sound smart. You're a lawyer, right? You're not a, a rapper, right? You want to talk, and I'm not you know, disrespecting any art form. I'm just saying you want to talk as eloquently as possible here. So one highbrow statement I like to make is whenever there is a products liability case, there's a contemporaneous argument for negligence. Whenever there's a strict liability case, there's a contemporaneous argument for negligence. So here it was strict liability, products liability to design it this way and manufacture it this way, right? And you, you'll go through, you know, a manufacturer, uh, supplier, distributor, or producer placed a defective product into the chain of commerce and it was under their exclusive control and the product was defective when it left their hands, right? And then we could do manufacturing defect, design defect, implied warranties of merchantability and fitness for a particular purpose and the express warranties. We could have that whole conversation. And then we can also say it was also negligent to design it this way or negligent to 
duty, breach, causation, damages. You get a whole lot of points. So we've already mentioned all these issues, negligence, prox liability, strict liability, responding superior, um, uh, misrepresentation, negligent training, negligent hiring. We're getting a lot of points on this essay so far. Okay, when Betty, it's always Betty. When Betty went home later that day, she told her friends and visit, oh, I'm sorry, sorry, this is for you. When Betty went home that day, she told her friend and visiting house guest Fran about power pills. Fran, who also had arthritis, wanted to try them. So Betty agreed to share her pills. Fran took the pills at the recommended dose, but Betty decided to take five times that amount on the theory that more is better. It's the Miami model, right? Um, what does this implicate? There's, there's foreseeability. So Fran is also gonna be in the foreseeability plaintiff to of care. Okay, so let's tease that out. We have duty and foreseeability. Um, what, what words can we use? Proximate cause. Um, Actual cause, proximate cause. This is just more into foreseeability, negligence, intervening, superseding events, right? That's a buzzword, intervening, superseding. I mean, Betty decided to take five times that amount. Three that more is better. Oh, be hard. It was foreseeable that Betty would overdose on pain or power pills, or it was not foreseeable. I mean, I tend to think it's more foreseeable, more is better. Power pills, like. But won't this also be comparative negligence? Exactly, beautiful. Can someone explain comparative negligence in Florida as of yesterday? And if you're more than 50% at fault, you can't recover. Exactly. And what else, what other points do we pretty much always get with um, comparative negligence in Florida? It's been abolished. Joint and several liability. Joint and several liability, right? We can always kind of get those points in. And then what's another point I always tell people that they can probably just drop it if there's a chance. Maybe not here, but what about the difference between the two? damages? Yeah, what's the limit in Florida? Is it? I never know, it's like three times or 50K or something like that. Three times or 500,000. 500,000. Three times, all right, sweet. So um, I like that comparative negligence here, uh, intervening superseding forces. I mean, there's a lot going on here, but mostly we have negligence, different theories of negligence and a strict liability products liability case seems to be a um, manufacturing design or a design defect we don't know it just says where do we see the word manufacture again oh they're manufactured by herbco <clears throat> okay interesting and uh, i have a question what? so you know how it's with fran so I, I forget so um fran because he's foreseeable he can bring a claim against the manufacturer but not the store right because this would would he be able to bring a claim against the store no right What's your argument? I mean, I just don't see how he would he would. I don't I don't I don't really understand that concept as well. So because I don't understand the foundation, I guess I can't really make an argument. So that's why I'm asking. Okay, can anyone give an argument either for or against that? Um, I would argue that yeah, the friend could sue the store because it was because of the 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 employee's statement about the medicine is the reason why the friend took the medicine in the first place. Well, that's I agree with that. Can the store um, be liable in a products liability case? They're not the ones who manufacture it. They're just the store who sold it. Yeah, retailers can be. Yeah, they can be. So and even, even if not, like the employer, it's so it's like the chain of foreseeability. So the sorry, the employee or the store by breaching the duty by giving this pill, it's foreseeable that other people might take this pill that are friends with Betty. So that's why Fran is a we, I agree. This is a beautiful essay. We have a classic, for lack of better words, to take out of Barbara's vocabulary, shit show, right? We have a classic situation right here where everyone's going to be making their arguments back and forth. Yeah, the story's going to be like, what are you talking about, Fran? Who are you? We, we sold this to Betty. I never told you nothing and then it's like what are you talking about um i'm friends with betty like I, she told me what you told me it's like domino ding 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 like you got to go both ways with this and argue i tend to agree with um what isa was saying that is pretty foreseeable and then i agree that 
the store could be held liable in a um, strict liability case because they were a retailer in the chain of commerce and you know there was a defective product potentially i don't think the product was really defective i just think they overdosed on it i think you're really gonna succeed more on the, the this claim you know that um they were great for arthritis i think that's the biggest problem here you claim they were great for arthritis and here it says they're energy boosters you know um Statute of limitations is interesting. Another thing is that it says on the warning label, a recommended dose of one pill three times a day. The friend was visiting, she had arthritis and she took five times the amount, right? Um, of the recommended dose. So like, there's definitely an argument there that like you read the label, it said one pill a day, you took five times. I mean, I think uh, there's arguments, right? You can, you can see how this is a beautiful essay for a personal injury attorney. If you want to go into personal injury, this is your essay right here. I have, want, what's up? Sorry, I just have a quick question about the warning labels. So that would be like, I, I, what's there's like a rule, right? That the manufacturer has to put labels. And then if they fit, I don't like, I'm not sure, but I know that there's something. There's, I mean, you have a duty. How, to would, you, how would you use that as a defense? What, what, can you? Clarify your question a little bit. I'm sorry. So, yeah. So the warning label, warning label by the manufacturer. That's a defense as to a product defect, the product liability case, or it's not. Um, it's a, the fact that you had a warning label on the product is certainly a viable defense to a product liability case on an express warranty theory. Right. The defense to you not failure to warn is that I did warn. Now, was it adequate or not is going to be the issue. But there's definitely no case here saying that there was no warning label because there was a recommended dose. Again, it doesn't even say, though, it doesn't say we don't know what happened yet. We still have to get through the facts. But I agree that the manufacturer has a stronger argument there that taking five times the recommended dose is actually, um, you know, cuts off some sort of liability in some sense. Again, arguments both ways. Let's continue through this essay because I want to do a lot of essays today. Um, Betty and Fran continued to take the pills until they were gone. Yeah, they were just taking tons of pills. Shortly thereafter, Betty developed heart palpitations that required hospitalization. Here we go. Um, her physician informed her that power pills contain an assortment of stimulants designed to give an energy boost. None of the ingredients has any application to arthritis pain, okay? So that was a terrible thing that you told her right here that it was great for arthritis. Um, in fact, one of the ingredients in power pills interact with prescription blood pressure to medicine to cause the palpitations. Betty will need surgery, repair damaged heart tissue. What is, what is this all about? Why are they telling us about her damaged heart tissue? I mean, for damages aspect of negligence. 100%. For eggshell plaintiff. So what you're, what, how are you liable for? You're liable for you know, pain and suffering. You're liable for lost wages. You could be liable for a whole lot. Um, around this time, Fran began to feel lightheaded and confused. What, why did they tell us that? Extensive blood tests by her doctor show high levels of mercury in her blood. Does that have to do with like, perhaps it was something that she already had, like an, a medical issue that she already had? Or manufacturing defect? Let's think about, I mean, there's a lot, I don't know. I don't, I don't pick this essay of the hat, but I see lightheaded and confused. What tort does that remind me of? Emotional distress. Yeah, that's what I think they're getting at. Around this time, she, like, maybe it's not a good argument for it, but I would say, you know, Frank could bring an argument for NID, IID. She felt lightheaded and confused. I would kind of tease these sentences out. That one seems emotional distressy. And then what is extensive blood test by her doctor showed high levels of mercury in her blood? I mean, that's more about damages. Are we, are we putting the mercury back to power pills or, or what you're saying is that she had high mercury in her blood? Um, you know, I mean, this is Fran. So Betty developed heart palpitations. Fran is fine, right? Fran had no issues, but just Fran feels lightheaded and confused. And now Fran has high levels of mercury in her blood. So they have separate damages, right? Fran has damages potentially, this is all potential for mercury, and um, Betty has potential damages 
for heart palpitations. Um, great, Carolina said something beautiful. I hope someone else can say it. She direct messages me, so she's right. Uh, what is interesting about someone's damages, about the heart palpitations and the mercury of blood, is that normal for someone to happen to someone? Or maybe it's because these ladies are especially sensitive, right? What would we call that? Eggshell. Eggshell plaintiff, right? Carolina messaged me and she said, you know, is eggshell plaintiff rule in, implied here? Or am I overthinking it? You're, ne you're never overthinking it on these Florida essays, in my opinion. Like the more the merrier, you know, you have a one hour or, you know, you have time extension, you have your time to write your essay. And the more you can write that's potentially relevant, the better. But you do have to get the main pieces of this. So here we have um, a memo discussing the pos possible cause of actions and defenses. So wait, um, Andrew, that sentence before it, it says Betty and Fran have requested you represent them um, both. Isn't that like an ethical um, issue that we have to like address in the memo? Um, what do you? I would say no. Really? Um, uh, actually, I so would say yes. like a like, like I would say yes, but to be fair, to be fair, you should not focus much time on that. Maybe three sentences on it at most, because it doesn't say address the ethical issues. It just says prepare a memo discussing the possible causes of action defenses. But because this is the Florida bar and you can always get cherries on top, I might say at the way end of this, not I might, I would at the very end of this say, it is important to note that defending both of you will implicate the duty of um, uh, what confidentiality or duty not to commingle or what what's the duty I'm thinking of? That's duty fine. loyalty. Duty, yeah, <laughs> conflict of interest. Thank you, thank you. Will implicate a conflict of interest, and I would have to be you know sure that I could reasonably represent both of you without you know, subjecting either of you to any disadvantages, and I would need to get written consent from each of you. You know, that, you know, might be a great piece to write. But to be fair, you might also get zero points for writing that. But it can't hurt. But if they didn't ask us directly, and when in doubt, just answer the question being asked. But I would also 100% write that. But I'm just saying, I wouldn't spend 10 minutes on it. I would spend, like we just did, three minutes thinking it through, writing it out, and, and getting some points. So that's a great question. Great catch. Um, so we notice the main things here is negligence, respondent superior, uh, misrepresentation, um, warranty claims, product liability, strict liability, um, comparative negligence, um, bossable of joint several liability, uh, intervening, superseding, foreseeability, um, talking about damages, big discussion about compensatory damages and what you can be compensated for, which is pretty much everything, and uh, maybe punitive damages if possible. Um, and then we talked about potentially IIED, NIED here. And then let's see what they said. So there you go, <laughs> look at this. The first thing they, they said, beautiful. I said I would mention at the end, they talked about it right at the beginning and see, they did it in five minutes or less, but beautiful point. I'm happy we addressed that. They didn't ask us to do it, but they did it. A lawyer may concurrently represent clients if the representation does not create conflicts and concurrent representation will not force the lawyer to represent one client to the detriment of the other client. Here, Betty and Fran have come to me as potential clients in consumer tort actions against these parties. Betty did give Fran half the power pills which might suggest some liability on Betty's, friend, Betty's part to Fran, right? They contribute to her negligence. But Betty is not a merchant. She has no expertise in prescribing medicine and she does not appear to have acted negligently. That is, breach the duty of care to Fran, said breach causing Fran's damages. Here, Betty seems to have acted reasonably prudent person in similar circumstances, relying on Carl's recommendations and relaying what she had learned to Carl to Fran. Betty and Fran are not concurrently in conflict and do not appear to be likely to become adverse to one another. The defendants may attempt to assert slightly different defenses against each woman, but they should not make Betty and Fran adverse to one another require me to represent one to the detriment of the other. Hence, I should be able to represent both Betty and Fran. That was a beautiful job. And that was also a beautiful job of them being like, let's get my hands dirty on this test. You know, they're just warming up. Let's see how they got all their points. Um, rule, certain consumer torts are actual against both the manufacturer and distributor of the manufacturer's products. And said sales of such products are necessarily performed via employees of the distributor. In addition, the distributor here 
have both implied and express warranties, some made through their employees, such as Carl. While Carl, an employee, may have, may have taken upon himself to make a recommendation to Betty, and thereby anything he might have said could be held as a statement admission by HBS, Carl is only a cashier and presumably does not enjoy a lavish income or have extensive resources, making him a less desirable defendant, especially compared with the relatively deep pockets of HFS and ERPO. Do you see how they're not writing 750 words? I, I told you, like, Florida essays are written like this, unfortunately. You still, they haven't gotten barely any points yet. I'm not, if you're not this type of writer, don't worry. They barely have gotten any points yet. Um, we may name Carl as a co-defendant merely sub to subject him to the jurisdiction and powers of the court. Um, so rule three, joiner of parties. A plaintiff may join any defendants whose allegedly tortious conduct arose from the same transaction or occurrence, and such defendants will be held liable to the proportion of their fault. Here we go. This is where we got to change things up. Florida has abolished joint several liability, ding, 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 which means that each dependent defendant pays his percent of plaintiff's recovery proportion to defendant's percentage of fault. Florida also follows a modified, right? We have to change this, comparative liability rule, which means that a plaintiff's recovery will be proportionally reduced by his percentage of fault, causing the harm for which he complains. Um, however, if a jury finds that a plaintiff is more than 50% at fault, Plaintiff will recover nothing. See how easy that was to fix? Okay. But you see, those were two things that we knew we were going to address, and they got their points right off the bat. They also, you know, they talked about the joint representation, and then they talked about the deep pockets of HVS. But let's get into the real issues. Implied warranty of merchantability. We definitely mentioned this. Each merchant, a person occupying the regular distribution and sale of products, impliedly warrants that the products that they sell are merchantable. That is fit for regular consumption and for the uses to which the products are usually put. In Florida, this implied warranty extends not only to the purchaser, but the purchaser's family and household guests. So that's that's key. You know, we no one said that precisely, but let's add that to our wheelhouse. In Florida, the implied warranty extends not only to the purchaser, but the purchaser's family and household guests. That right there, if you had any question about the foreseeability of Fran or Betty or whoever, there we, we have it distinctly. The, this implied warranty may be negated through an express disclaimer using such words as as is or this product is sold with no express or implied warranties. It's also a nice thing to note. Now, for those of you who didn't write long essays, this is a great essay to learn from about how to write a long essay. Also recognize that a lot of the model answers, in my opinion, probably were written by students who had time extensions. So if you can't, you, you feel like you can never do it, just know that these are the model answers, right? These are the model answers. Here, Betty and Fran will argue that HVS is in the regular business of selling food supplements such as power pills. Power pills is a product that HVS regularly sells. Betty bought power pills, which places her in the position of the consumer of the product, and Fran was a household guest of Betty at the time Betty gave Fran some of the power pills. Moreover, both Betty and Fran, subject to proof of causation, claim that the pills made them sick. See, HVS will argue, this is Ira Oak, right? The opposing argument. HFS will argue that Betty and Fran took the pills, not for an energy boost, but for arthritis, and they did not make usual use of the product. Betty and Fran will counter that the implied warranty merely holds that the product is safe and will not injure the consumer and that the pills did injure them. See here, this is just merchantability. This isn't fitness for a particular purpose. Merchantability is just that the product is safe and works, it turns on, you know, it's just not like a harmful product. It's not saying it's fit for any particular purpose. So they did a really good job about the products are merchantable, regular consumption and uses for which they're usually put, not a particular purpose. So they did a good job with merchantability. Conclusion, a product like power pills sold by a merchant like HFS contains an implied warranty of merchantability, and there's no evidence that HFS expressly displaying this implied warranty. Moreover, Betty as a direct consumer and Fran as a consumer's household guest are protected under this implied warranty. Subject to proving causation, Betty and Fran should recover under this cause of action. Next one, warranty for a particular purpose. You see they're crushing this. Did HVS breach their warranty rule for fitness for a particular purpose? I love how this is written as just like as IRAC. You know, they literally just did I-R-A-O-C. They made no frills about it, you know? I don't tend to write that way. Like I said, I have an English major, you know, but like this is a great way to write a, a essay that passes and passes with flying colors. You don't have to get too fancy. You just have to do it formulaically. Okay. 
Warranty for a particular purpose. Did HVS breach the warranty fit for a particular purpose? Rule, beautiful, we should all be paying attention here. A merchant will be held liable if a consumer apprises a merchant of a particular need, the merchant recommends a particular product to meet that particular need, the consumer relies on the merchant's recommendation, the consumer purchases the product, the consumer uses the product, the product does not perform the particular use, the consumer is injured thereby either directly or in the fullness of time in which the consumer uses the product, right? That's the fitness for a particular purpose. That seems to directly apply here. Like you told them it was good for uh, arthritis. Now, do you need to write a rule that has seven elements to it? Like this person is obviously a machine, you know? Do your best, you know? It's okay on test day if you just remember fitness for a particular purpose and you write, this means that if, someone warrants that the product will work for a particular, you can even rewrite, you know what I'm saying? Like reason, then they'll be subject to damage. Something like that. Like you don't have to write the world's most perfect definition, but if you want to get a wonderful score on my great rubric, this is how you do it. Like the more you can memorize and recite word for word, the better the Florida bar will grade it. So uh, finish particular purchase, the consumer apprise emerges a particular need, the merchant recommends a particular product to meet that need. They rely on the recommendation. They purchase the product. They use the product. The product doesn't not perform the use that they said. And the consumer is injured thereby either directly or in the fullness of time in which the consumer uses the product. The merchant will also be liable to anyone who obtains the product from the consumer who relied on the merchant's recommendation and uses the product. This sentence right here and um, this sentence right there answer any questions about whether we're going to let Fran come in or Betty come in, you know, the second one, like we're definitely applying the foreseeability to the, the guest, the household guest. Um, Betty and Fran will argue that Betty told Carl that Betty was looking for arthritis medicine, did not know which supplement to buy. They will also argue that Carl, knowing of Betty's requirements, undertook to recommend power pills specifically for the purpose of relieving arthritis pain, and that Betty, relying solely on Carl's recommendation, purchased the pills, took the pills, and shared the pills with Fran. HFS will argue that specifically instructed Carl not to recommend products to customers and that when he made the recommendation to Betty, he was acting outside the scope of his employment and that HFS should not be held liable for Carl's statements. Now see how they, they put in vicarious liability. I love this essay. This is very well written. An employer will be, an employer will be held liable for the acts of its employees if the employee's act was done within the scope of the employee's duties. The employee's acts were not willful for one time unless the employer authorized or otherwise authorized, authorized the will for wanton conduct. Normally, employers are not liable for their employees torts against the body of a person, battery, false imprisonment, et cetera, but an employer may be held liable for such torts if physical contact with customers is a part of the employee's job, such as a bouncer at a nightclub. See, I say these things all the time. This person is really good at articulating them, really good. So, you know, this is an essay that I would go back and study for sure when it comes to products liability. Here, HVS will argue that Carl was specifically told not to recommend products to consumers. That is, HVS will argue that the scope of Carl's employment was expressly delimited to not give recommendations. And therefore, when he ventured to give a recommendation, he was acting outside the scope of his employment and HFS should therefore not be liable for Carl's statements. Betty and Fran will counter that Betty had no reason to know that Carl was not qualified or authorized to make recommendations. And therefore, HFS should be held liable to them as merchant of the pills. I have a comment that says this would take three hours to write. The reason that I teach for model essays is because one, they are written by humans. Maybe they had time extensions, maybe not. You know, who knows? But another thing is there's some essays that are model answers that are relatively short. You just want to push for greatness. Like when I was a kid, I, I used to love baseball. I used to watch Ken Griffey Jr. swinging tapes. Like, duh, I've never hit a baseball like Ken Griffey Jr. But, you know, modeling your swing after him is the way to get better. These are model answers. You're modeling your answer off this. You're doing your best. Um, someone's saying they have to go over products liability. Products liability is heavily tested. So is defamation. I mean, to be fair, last February, they tested torts and contracts. And now we started my class with contracts and torts. Is it likely that both of these subjects will be tested in July? I don't know. But it's just some food for thought. Okay, let's continue. So here we talked about... Um, they should be held liable under vicarious liability. They should have wrote respondeat superior. Obviously, their Latin needs some improvement. No, I'm kidding. Okay. Um, conclusion, HVS will be held liable for because it, was, it well, probably because it specifically delimited scope of employment and Carl exceeded that scope by making the recommendation. 
I don't test necessarily agree with that. Honestly, I would say it was within the scope and it was probably they would be held liable. However, they would have an argument for indemnity or contribution from the employee, depending on their, I mean, there's a whole freaking argument there, but again, do you see how the conclusion is the least important thing and how the dumb, the knowledge of the rules is the most important thing? Like, that's what I believe. Um, Matt, who is my UBE instructor, he says the analysis is the most important thing. So me and him at least agree that it's not the conclusion. Okay, rule. A merchant may be held liable to a customer if the merchant makes an express warranty about its product and its characteristics, not mere puffery. Puff daddy. Um, yeah, analysis is definitely important. And the, But again, you can't, your analysis is only important if you got the issue in the rule right. Like analysis just naturally follows, but you do need a strong issue in rule. And the product does not live up to the express warranties. Analysis. Betty and Fran will argue that Carl may express warranties about the pills, especially about their effectiveness regarding arthritis and the pills did not conform to this warranty. So these are express warranties. We talked about it. Once again, they'll argue that would not be liable. Vicarious liability. I mean, they copied and pasted. I would never do that. I would just say C rule above, but whatever. Here, HFS will argue that Carl was specifically told not to recommend product to customers. That is, he will argue the scope of employment was expressly delimited. When he ventured to give a recommendation, he was acting outside the scope of his employment. They will counter that he had no way of knowing that Carl lacked the authority to make such recommendations and they should be protected under an equitable fairness theory. It's a nice, nice thought. HVS will probably prevail under vicarious liability theory because a trier of fact will probably find that Carl did exceed the scope of his employment by making express warranties about the pills. So again, they're saying we'll probably prevail under vicarious liability. I don't necessarily agree with them, but it doesn't matter. We would all get the same, we both write same great essays. Because why? We identified all the issues, we wrote all the rules, we did all the analyses, and then we just, you know, this is what the court will probably find. It depends what, what their politics are. We know how courts are. All right, did HVS commit a misrepresentation when Carl sold the pills to Petty, to Betty? So misrepresentation, great. Misrepresentation rule. This is a great essay for rule statements. <laughs> yeah, she's, like she said, getting that worked out. <laughs> you don't get points for rewriting rules. That's a fact. A merchant commits misrepresentation when he knowingly makes false statements about a product with the intention of inducing a customer to buy the product. The misrepresentation does induce the customer to buy the product. The customer's reliance was justifiable and the customer's injured therefrom. therefrom. Betty will argue that Carl made the, knew that the pills did not help our brightness, that he knowingly recommended the pills make a sale and that Betty knowingly, knowing nothing about food supplements, reasonably justified, relied on Carl's misrepresentation that she was injured. HVS that they were outside the scope of the employment. I mean, they keep coming back to this. See vicarious liability above. There you go. And Carl will argue that he honestly believed that a power pose was good for arthritis, thereby negating the intent element of causation. They'll probably prevail because he did indeed think they would have helped, and Carl lacked the requisite knowing and intent elements for misrepresentation action. That's a good point there. So they're saying they won't prevail on intentional misrepresentation because he didn't know that it was a lie. Maybe it would be a negligent misrepresentation. Either way, the conclusion is probably prevail. Who knows? That's not as important as identifying the misrepresentation issue. I can't stress that enough. Um, I don't know if someone said 3,191 words. I don't know what that means. Um, Carl, will is that how long this essay is, is you're saying? Carl, will oh yeah. I mean, that's long. That's very long. This is double what it needs to be. Carl will probably prevail because it appears from the facts that Carl did indeed think power pills would have helped Betty and therefore lack requisite knowing intent elements for misrepresentation. Now we do strict liability. Are they liable under strict prox liability theory? Did they do or do not relieve these defense of liability? A manufacturer sure of prox liability will be held strictly liable for injuries caused by that product if the product was unreasonably dangerous, the product left the manufacturer in a dangerous condition, the distributor did not alter the product, the product was dangerously defective in one, of th one or more of three ways, defectively manufactured. The product was properly designed, but somehow was made defectively in the manufacturing process. Safeguards against defective manufacture are no defense to this claim. Defectively designed. The product was defectively designed, making it unreasonably dangerous. Or as Barbara said, it was designed shitty. There was no other economically reasonable way of making the product to serve its intended use at a commercially reasonable price. This is where I would talk about the balancing test between the utility of it versus the risk of the danger. Defective warnings. The product was properly designed and manufactured, 
but the product lacked warning labels and or instructions that would have put an average consumer on notice of dangerous aspects of the product. Such warning must be conspicuous, legible, clear, understandable, right? Beautiful. I mean, oh, the consumer made foreseeable use of this product. Such use does not have to be intended use, just foreseeable use, right? Like it's foreseeable that you would use a lighter to burn down a house, you know, even though that's not intended. The product caused injury, the consumer suffered harm. Mere economic loss to the product, right? The RV blows up is not enough to prevail on this claim. There must be damage to the consumer, the consumer's property. If there's only damage to the product itself, the product, the proper cause of action is breach of contract, right? You get a refund. Amazing, right? This is a seven piece, uh, sorry, sorry, I have to zoom out, it's such a long rule. But this is a seven piece rule right here, right? Um, but I said this just in class, you know, I totally believe that I, knowing what I knew and having the discussion we had and having the tools I have could have written this essay in 2,000 words, I mean, 2,000 characters or 10,000 words. Um, I'm sorry, 2,000 words or 10,000 characters. So half of the space and wrote a wonderful essay because they haven't identified any rules of law that we didn't identify. And their rules are super long and like, you know, they're, they're like, I think Ernest Hemingway used to get paid by the word. Like they're obviously trying to stretch it out, but I know that we could have written a great essay in, uh, in half the speed and half the time. Okay, so Betty and Fran, half the amount of words. So Betty and Fran will argue that Erbco manufactured a reasonably dangerous product. They caused palpitations in Betty and mercury poisoning in Fran, that the product reached Betty via HBS in an unaltered condition, presumed unless evidence shows the distributor somehow altered the product. The product lacks sufficient warnings, that Betty and Friend made foreseeable use and both were injured from their use. HFS and Herbco's best defenses will be that Betty's taking five times the recommended dosage will not make foreseeable use. We're all over this. Betty will counter that it's wholly foreseeable that someone would think that if one is five, one is good, five must be even better. That's what I said, that's the Miami motto. Um, HFS, Herbco could also argue that Betty assumed the risk, that is Betty was apprised of the risk and knowing the risk chose to proceed anyway. Namely, that the pill is clearly stated, a recommended dosage, and Betty knowing they exceed this limitation. You see, they're doing a great job making the argument we did. Um, someone saying this person was probably a personal injury attorney. Yeah, probably. Betty will counter that the assumption of risk only avails that the plaintiff is fully aware of all the potential risk and still goes ahead, but that the pill's recommended dosage did not warn of heart palpitations as a possible negative event. I had a student last administration who was a personal injury attorney from Connecticut. And she got the highest score on the personal injury, on the torts test I've ever seen. So there's definitely truth to that. Um, okay, here we see the eggshell plaintiff. That was a great job. I think that was uh, Carolina. Great job, right? You just get points for identifying cool things. A defendant takes his plaintiff as he finds him. Hence, the defendant will be liable for any harm to the plaintiff that arises from his tortious act and attribute to plaintiff's condition. Defendant's liability may be limited or severed through unforeseeable intervening acts. But rescuers and medical malpractice and injuries arising from treatment are foreseeable and therefore not superseding intervening acts, but might lessen defendant's percentage of fault. Fran must prove causation. If she does this, she will be able to prevail both against both companies since Florida has abolished the privity requirements for strict product liability and has extended liability for all foreseeable users of the product in question, right? Florida has abolished privity requirements for strict liability, extended liability to all foreseeable uses. Yeah, this person definitely practices personal injury in Florida. I'm about to hire the next time I get an accident. Or if I ever get an accident. That is both Betty and Fran were partly to blame for their injuries. Here a jury might find that Betty's five fold in ingestion, five fold ingestion, this person is hilarious. Well foreseeable was nonetheless blameworthy and would her portion of the damages. Even if she's not now this is fault. If she's 90% at fault, she can't recover. Right. Guys. Here, the facts show that Fred followed the recommended doses and therefore does not seem like ledger, right? We know that we would talk about modified, compar com modified comparative negligence here, partial comparative negligence, where if you're 50% at fault, you can't recover if you're more than 50% at fault. Here, if found at fault, she could recover contribution and indemnification. That's what I was saying, because HVS merely distributed the power post from Herbco without altering the product, but these parties probably have a contribution indemnification provision and distribution agreement. This person knows what they're talking about. I always say this. People are like, wait a minute, it doesn't make any sense. Like the store is gonna be held liable, they didn't manufacture it. This question is asking if they can be held liable. The answer is yes. 
in reality, they would get contribution or indemnification from whoever was really, really liable. But we're not going to put that burden on the injured party. The injured party is getting their money back from the store, and then the store needs to seek contribution or indemnification from another party. So this person really got that straight. But for your sake, just know that the main part of this essay is how to write about strict liability, manufacturing defect, products defect, implied warranty of merchantability, implied warranty of fitness for a particular purpose, um, and warranties and the like. And then negligence. I told you there's always a contemporaneous argument for negligence. This is a wonderful essay. Um, were they negligent in manufacturing and distributing the pills? Negligence occurs when we have a duty. Persons have a duty to act as a hypothetically reasonably prudent person would act in the circumstances. Here, Herb Co. had a duty. Herb Co. had a duty to act as a reasonably prudent manufacturer and make sure it did not place a dangerous product in the stream of commerce. Do you see how it's the same thing, but they're just saying instead of doing strict liability, we're going to actually argue negligence. Here, they had a duty. They had a breach, right? They breached it because they failed to act reasonable. They manufactured a dangerous person that was unreasonable. Therefore, they breached a duty. Causation, but for, right? And then proximate, foreseeable plaintiff. We nailed this. Compensatory, take note of this part right here. I said for everything, this is everything. Pain and suffering, medical expenses, loss of work, loss of consortium. Those are four things that you can mention. That's just four points potentially. Write that down if you're ready. Punitive, exemplary damages to punish, right? Three times compensatories. Oh, they started spelling things wrong at the end here. Um, or $500,000. No cap on punitives if the defendant intentionally harmed plaintiff or defendant was intoxicated or under the influence of drugs at the time, or if the harm is to the elderly, I think. Okay, um, negligent hiring. Again, we talked about this. An employer can be held for negligent hiring if the employer knowingly hires a person who is not qualified for the job or the person has a record of behavior that makes him a danger to the employee's customer's charges. Negligent hiring is one of the rare civil torts in which the character of the defendant is at issue, and therefore the court will allow evidence as to the character otherwise banned from consideration of torts. That's an evidence piece right there, which is such a fire point. Like, you don't have to write that, but that is a true point that like defamation or negligent hiring, we're actually going to be able to bring in character evidence, but trust me, we'll talk about that when we do evidence. That's foreshadowing. Um, analysis, was it negligent hiring? I mean, I don't want to, I want to get to new essays, but yeah, you hired this dunce cap. And you know they could say that they forbade him from making these recommendations. You just go back. He had caused proclivity for making spurious recommendations. Like this person is an excellent writer. Conclusion: There's simply not enough facts to support negligent hiring. I would have even talked about negligent training. I mean, see, I had one more tort than that. This was a great essay. Was this an essay that anyone's going to write on test day in one hour? Absolutely not. But like I said, that's Ken Griffey Jr. swing. It's uh, I don't know who you guys look after these days, but it's modeling. Yeah, it's very long. Does anyone, before we go on to the next essay, that was a lot. Anyone have any questions in general besides that was amazing? I can never do that. You know, like just questions about prox liability, strict liability. I have a question on, because I remember when I was doing the bar prep at my school for the respondent superior and like vicarious liability, it was something about like my professor was like, oh, just because you hold the actual employee liable doesn't mean it doesn't like, I guess, preclude you from going after the actual employer. So on the bar, should we be making that argument as well? Like, yeah, you can go after Carl, but if that fails, you can also go after the store. Yeah, they made that argument literally in the first, that was the first thing they said was the deep pockets argument. Yeah, no one's going after call the cashier when they can go after H&M. And if you can go after the employee, like that's why we have vicarious liability. So Good job, bar prep tutor. He did. He did well. Um, does anyone? I have a question. Sorry. Um, so you know how he talked about a bunch of points in the beginning, and you were like, he's not really getting any points at this point. Should we just flip it then, because we don't have that much time? So should we just put in all the important stuff first, and then if we still have time, we'll just add that in there? Remember what I said. You don't know that he wrote that first. That's just how you read it. Knowing that guy who I know at all, a girl or non-binary, whoever wrote that. I bet you they didn't write that first, you know, like maybe they did, maybe they didn't, but they probably had a time extension. Clearly, you can't write that many words. They probably had a double time extension. And like I said, I might write ethics first and put that last, or I might write, you know, my point being is write the most important things first. You don't necessarily have to present them to the reader in the order you write it, but you better write them first. Yeah, if you didn't write about products liability, strict liability, negligence, 
you know, you're not getting a passing essay because you spend so much time writing about uh, conflict of interest or the deep pockets of the employer. What's up, Scarlett? And for the record, that person never wrote responding superior. So I don't know if it was that wonderful. What's up, Scarlett? Um, so I wanted to ask because you said they might have copied and pasted the rule. Is that actually a function on the bar? Because I, I was told it wasn't. No, you cannot copy and paste on the bar. Oh, so they wasted their time doing that. Okay, got it. Within your essays, you're able to copy and paste things like in your writing portion, but you can't do anything outside of it. Exactly. So it's like on Exemplify. But you can copy, like you write something, you could copy it and paste it later. But again, you're not getting points. You're better off just writing C rule above. But you can't copy directly from the prompt itself. So it's like exam four, like whatever you wrote, you can copy what you wrote and paste it somewhere else. But if it's like from the actual, I guess, fact pattern, you're not going to be able to copy the facts. You're going to have to write them out. Okay, got it. Okay, sorry. It's just I've never taken the bar. So I was like trying to like map no, it out. No, no. And, and in general, if you have questions about like that, let's keep that, you know, in the Telegram chat. I want this to be content based. So what uh, what's another year? What um year do we want to do? 16, 2016. 2016, all right. 2016, I think that's the year I graduated from law school, actually. I was supposed to graduate in 2015, but I did the MBA program that kept me for another year. This, oh, you wanna know something? This is a mislabeled, um, they did, they did this on purpose, like not on purpose, but this is the Florida Bar's fault, not our fault. If you go to 2016, they literally label it as a torch essay, but it's a combo essay. So we gotta do another year. I'm sorry about that. How about 2011? What happened in 2011? There is no 2011, 2019? 2019? Uh, if, if you go to the opposite side, um, you were there. So yeah, it's right. Right there. Perfect. 2019. 2019, the year COVID-19 came. Actually, I think it was 2020 that COVID-19. All right, this is a really great one to do. I can just see by looking at it. It's test something else that's heavily tested. Um, let's see what the uh, call to question is. So let's not worry about the ethical issue, the referral fee. You know, they offer to pay a referral fee. Well, you have to actually participate in the case. You have to get written consent from the person you have to be you know it has to be reasonable and all that but let's not worry about that um let's worry about this prepare a memo that discusses the claims and defenses involved in paula's proposed lawsuit against supermarket in this memo include a discussion of the ethical issues involved in a lawyer's in a lawyer fees proposal okay so claims and defenses paula v supermarket right We'll skip the second part. So again, meaning it's going to take us 10 minutes to write the second part. So we only have about 50 minutes to write this part. And this part is Paula v. Supermarket. Let's do some analysis. As part of its new marketing program, Supermarket offered a service that would deliver digital coupons to its customer cell phones upon entering any of the supermarket stores. Paula registered for the service and used it often. So there's a store that has a digital coupon program and then we're registering for services. Paula was shopping at supermarket and received a message from supermarket containing new coupons. So while she was shopping, she received the message. As she walked down the frozen food aisle, she scrolled through the coupons in her phone. In looking at the coupons, Paula, Paula did not see a large puddle of melted ice cream in the aisle. She slipped on the puddle and hit her head on the floor. All right, who hasn't really spoken so far that wants to take a stab at this? How about, uh, Gab, are you with us? All right, sorry, yes. I didn't know you are eating, but. Mm, sorry, no, it's just candy. <laughs> okay, something sweet. So can you tell us some things that you noticed from this so far? Yes, because I just submitted this in my accountability um, folder like an hour ago. Okay. Um, so the first thing I noticed was um, that the ice cream was melted. So that for premise liability, it probably 
they Paula would be able to show that they were negligent because in their duty to inspect the premises, they should have caught it because the fact that it's melted shows that it's been there for a while. Um, let me see what else I wrote down in my notes when I was doing it. Um, I also thought that they would say contributory negligence because she was um, looking down while she was walking. But in my response, I said that obviously I doubt that that's gonna be more than 50% at fault. And she was in the supermarket looking at coupons that the supermarket had just sent her as she entered um, the, I guess, store. So she, it was their fault that she was looking down at her phone as well. Um, when you say it was their fault, I agree with you. It was negligent to have a program that caused people to look at their phones while shopping, right? I totally agree with you. And what you said, you nailed the key word that I want everyone to make sure that they recognize, premise liability. This is a premise liability case because we are in a store. Now, who is Paula? How do we call her in the word of law? Invitee. Yeah, she's an invitee, right? And so what does that mean? Higher duty to warn of like known yeah. dangers or unknown, uh, sorry, and condition, make safe conditions. Right, so in the invitee will have the highest duty, you have you know, the duty to sweep, and, and Gabby made an excellent point of noticing that it's uh, melted. Ice cream takes a while to melt. They should have cleaned that up. Um, we're gonna see right here, employee. So employer, I'm already thinking vicarious liability, responding superior, you know, we wanna get those points. Um, the negligence piece, right? It was negligent to have a program where people are looking at their phone as they're walking. It's also negligent in the case of the premise liability, you know, that they should have, they had a duty to, to sweep up. They didn't sweep up. She it was foreseeable that she would fall. All these things that she hit her head. I think we nailed it. Anyone have anything else from up here that they see? What about res ipsa loquitur? What about it? Well, can you just make the argument that I guess they're, well, you can go for both ways, but um, it speaks for itself. You're in a supermarket, like it fell. Um, you could be liable, but then again, someone else could have um, spilled it or something. Yeah. I do, again, I don't ever hate words that are legal terminology that are potentially relevant. I would very quickly, if I were you, and that came to mind, say race tips to um, this, uh Who was it? Paula may argue under theory of race tips to loquitur, the thing speaks for itself, that with, in the absence of negligence, ice cream doesn't just fall on the floor. Therefore, it must have been you know, the supermarket's liability. However, the supermarket would contend that a, another customer, a little child, could have thrown the ice cream on the floor because they were not in the exclusive control of their products in their store. The race a stronger argument is under the theory of premise liability, they had a duty to maintain a safe premises. I, I don't think that mentioning race ipsa is a bad thing, but personally, I don't think it prevailed here because like I just said, it doesn't really speak for itself there. There's other ways ice cream could have gotten on the floor in particular, little kid throwing the ice cream on the floor wouldn't necessarily be the uh, supermarket's fault. But again, mentioning things is good. Anything else that we see that could, is mentionable here? The comparative negligence modified, abolished joint several liability, um, slipped and hit her head. So that's definitely damages, foreseeability, all these things. Okay. As a supermarket employee arrived right after the fall, responding superior, and helped Paula to her feet. Ooh, what does that implicate? Just rendering aid. Yes, okay, rendering aid, and you have no duty to render aid, but if you do, you have to continue doing it in a reasonably safe manner. What else does that implicate in torts? Whenever I see this, what am I thinking of? It's a very weak argument that's gonna fail. A battery? Battery. I think that's a weak argument for battery. Like, what? You just grabbed me? Don't touch me. You know what I mean? 2019, like this is the middle of COVID. You're just gonna batter me. You know what I'm saying? A weak argument because you're administering aid, but uh, whenever I see contact, my mind is triggering battery very quickly. Okay. Paula said she felt dazed and asked the employee to call her husband, Harold. Oh, the husbands are always problem starters on the bar, to drive her home. Harold arrived shortly thereafter and picked up Paula. While driving back to Paula's and his house, Harold began typing a message. Oh, Lord. Typing and 
texting and typing. What is that? Intervening causation. Mm -hmm. Superseding. Sorry. And uh, negligence per se. Thank you. I was just going to say, I'm already thinking about negligence per se. I know that's a statute. You can't text and drive. Um, while well, Harold was texting, what do you think happened? It's always the husband, I'm telling you. The car swerved to the right and hit the curb, causing Paula to bang her head against the window. So now she hit her head on the floor. Paula is having a rough day, you know? Now she's in the car and she's banging her head against the window. So Harold is definitely uh, involved. And the supermarket is going to try and seek contribution from Harold, for sure. Intervening, superseding. Is it foreseeable that the dumb husband is going to come up and Homer Simpson his way through life? Like, absolutely foreseeable. But uh, we'll argue both ways. Um, Paula said she felt dazed. Asked the employee to call her husband. Dazed? I still think, you know, there's battery argument here. Mostly it's the, it's the premise liability thing. I don't know about IED or NIED, but they can always come potentially. Anything else we see from this paragraph? Definitely Harold's negligence. After suffering headaches, Paula consulted a doctor and was diagnosed with severe concussion. She's been unable to work because of persistent headaches. Can you recover for that? Your money for, yeah, you can. Of course. She's lost income and incurred medical expenses. Can she recover for that? Yes. Yeah, all this, she's recovering for all this. And now seeks to recover from the supermarket. Okay. Um, did we miss anything? Besides I have that? a question about that paragraph when you can't tell what was the cause, like which negligence, was it the supermarket or the husband? Um, yeah, you're talking about- um, Forces that just- What's it called? I, that's what I can't. Alternative liability theory. Okay, you're talking about the alternative liability theory. And yeah, I mean, you can bring that up. I don't see that being super relevant here. That's more like when two people, there's both evidence that they did something negligent and you need, yeah, actually, yeah, I think it is relevant here. Alternative liability, you have to prove that your negligent isn't the one who caused the injury. That's, I don't know if they're going to mention this in the fact pattern, but Key point. I like that. A good point. Alternative liability theory. Usually I'm thinking of two people who negligently shoot at the shooting range. We don't know whose bullet went in there. You got to prove it wasn't yours. That's a thought. I think definitely foreseeability, actual cause, proximate cause, you know, but for zone of danger, intervening, superseding, all these things are coming up. I think negligence, you know, the supermarket seems pretty negligent here and premise liability, uh, the duty to an invitee, um, I like negligence per se. Let's see what the, and if this is the one I assigned to you, I could care less. You know, we're going to, I want you to look through every single essay and they all should be repetitive. We want this to all be very repetitive. We'll go through this one quicker so we can go through probably two more. So negligence, duty breach, causation, damages. If you don't know that now, I saw this, this video on Instagram. It's like something about lawyers and they just graduated law school. And this girl goes around to law school graduation, asks people questions about the law. And like, they know nothing, literally nothing. This is the only thing people know is what is negligence. But they were like, what is intermediate scrutiny? And the guy's like, um, it's like more than rational basis. <laughs> like, that's all I got. I was like, Lord. all right. The issue is whether the defendant, the supermarket owed a duty to Paula. Generally, a duty is owed to all foreseeable victims. So um, Florida has abolished the distinction between licensees and invitees. Rather, the victims who are on the premise lawfully who have not exceeded the scope of their invitation on their property are all classified as invitees. Uh, again, this is not a 100% I agree with statement. There's a classification called a licensed invitee, but you're fine just talking about licensees and invitees and as a, um, an invitee. Okay. The duty to invitees is keep the premise reasonably safe for the benefit of the invitee, warn of latent or not readily known defects to the landowner and make reasonable inspections to, and make safe any dangerous conditions on the land, right? They had to do reasonable inspections. Commercial business owners owe a heightened duty. That's a key word, heightened duty to um, victims and residential commercial landlords are required. Business owners must also keep the premises free of any movably or transit, movable or transitory substances and unreasonably dangerous artificial or natural conditions to any invitee on the property and others adjacent to the premises. So this is the duty for they owe to the invitees. They got to keep it safe. There can't be any dangerous conditions and they have to make reasonable inspections. They definitely did that. Didn't do that here. She slipped and fell. She was foreseeable plaintiff because she went there 
and we have satisfied the settlement. The breach, you know, they have a duty to keep it free from transitory substances. It's not necessary that the supermarket actually knows the condition as long as it could have been uncovered by unreasonable inspection. The rule is appropriate because it's full of transitory substances. So the ground that becomes slippery, which is a hazard to customers. She's going to assert it was breached because the ice cream is transitory. They keep using that word. And the supermarket failed to make reasonable inspections to discover the defect because it was melted on the ground in the frozen aisle. The facts then indicate that a food usually found in the frozen aisle, like we fell from the freezer while still frozen. Like, do you see how they talk about, they get like a hundred words out by just saying like, it clearly had been there for a minute, you know? That's how people, in, and where I'm from Philly, would talk, they'd be like, yeah, ice cream's been there for a minute, come on. But here the ice cream had fell, that indicated that it fell from the freezer while still frozen, was on the ground for long enough to melt. This indicates that the store could have uncovered this spill by reasonable inspection. Like, that's how you write a bar essay. You gotta write like that. Furthermore, the fact that the employee arrived at the aid of Paul, Paul right after the fall indicates that there's an employee nearby who could have recovered and made, like, that's a good thought, right? There was someone right there. Come on, man. You couldn't clean up the ice cream. Causation. The most problematic issue is proving that the supermarket breach was a legal and proximate cause. So we have but four is the factual. Proximate is natural foreseeable. So a more difficult find proving this because um, there must be considered, right? And they did a good job. They went through the first head injury, right? She fell. And then the second injury was the vehicle injury. Here we go. Great rule for everyone to learn. The rule generally is that the nature of injuries must be foreseeable and not the result of an intervening or superseding cause of the injuries. Meanwhile, the extent of the injuries do not have to be foreseeable in severity. Under the eggshell plaintiff theory, a defendant takes the victim in whatever the fragility of the condition. Remember, intervening superseding, an intervening cause will not relieve liability where a superseding cause will relieve liability. Intervening might just mean contribution. Here it's hard to determine, you know, it's hard to determine. The husband was an idiot, supermarket was dumb. Uh, it, if this is the case, it was okay. It is difficult to determine whether to extend the injuries are a result of the original slip or fall. If this is the case, it must only be shown that the supermarket's conduct was a substantial factor in her injuries. In this regard, the supermarket will likely offer evidence that the injuries to her head as a result of the fall were of a different nature than the second injuries to her head that were injured and they can be distinguished. Like she's just kind of making stuff up here. However, Paula will likely argue that the injuries were increased as a result of the fall and argue that the further injuries are within the scope of foreseeability required a proven proximate cause. In this argument, Paula may be persuasive because as mentioned, the further severity of injuries caused by the offense negligence have been found to be the natural and foreseeable consequence of offense negligence. I agree. I'd say it's foreseeable that the dumb husband was gonna come and, and be dumb. Remember, this is now partial, right? Modified. Um, Florida courts have done away with implied assumption of risk defense, supermarket may wish to assert it, so you have to actually assert it, because Paula impliedly assumed the risk of looking at a phone while walking. However, the defense is not gonna work. Remedies, she can recover. Um, compensatory versus punitive. We talked about punitive being limited to three extra 500,000. If Paula is the primary breadwinner, her husband may also sue for loss of income and support from Paula, right? Her husband who caused a head injury is now gonna sue for loss of income. That's, that's what husbands do. The supermarket may assert any of the defenses above in order for the plaintiff to less damage under theory of partial compared negligence. Um, not regardless if she's over. See, this all changes now. I'm, I'm glad we're doing this in real time. These are model answers. Like, this isn't my fault. These are what they wrote, but this is obviously outdated. If the husband is found uh, to be a partial cause, supermarket concurred a full liability under joint and several liability, which is also wrong. Florida has abolished joint and several liability. So do you see how these model answers are not perfect. These are written by humans. They literally just wrote a wrong thing right here. Like, I'm just like, wrong. But it helps to have, you know, me or one of my instructors go over these essays with you because we can help clarify when there are some mistakes. I think that essay was relatively easy. I may have assigned it. If I did, you should all knock it out of the park. There's literally no excuse for not writing two essays per week. That's two hours of your time. You know, you can literally write them at your lunch break today. Um, all right, let's pick another essay. Let's do two more. We'll do them a little bit quicker just to get more exposure. So far, we've seen products liability, which is a strict liability case. That strict liability could be manufacturing defect, design defect, express warranties, implied warranties of merchantability or fitness for a particular purpose. That are, one had negligence. It had responding superior. It had an IIED or an NIED piece to it. It had an eggshell plaintiff. And then this one we just saw also had eggshell plaintiff, but this one was more focused on um, uh, Premise liability, duty breach, causation damages, 
duty to invitees, um, foreseeability, intervene, superseding. A lot of things are replaying. And both of them, as I've, as I've predicted, have had the modified comparative negligence argument, the abolishment of joint and several liability, and uh, opportunity to talk about compensatory versus punitive damages. All right, let's pick another one. Um, I said that I was gonna look at the essay that from Aunt Martha. You guys wanna check that one out? Anyone have any questions or anything where I pull this essay up from February? Do we think- I, I, um, Was that essay, the previous one we just did, I feel like it was a lot shorter than some of the other ones. Yeah. Do you agree? I agree that it was shorter. And I also agree that I've seen a whole lot of essays and it's like a mixed bag. You know, some essays, it's like, this is so long. And some are just like, bam, here it is. You know, it's okay to spend an hour 20 on one essay and 40 minutes on the other essay. My general rule of thumb is this. After, let's say you have no extensions. You're just a regular test taker. You have three hours to write this test. After two essays, you should be at two hours. You should give your, you should try to give yourself one full hour to write the last essay, which means write your first essay. You know, if you write that essay in an hour and 10, then take 50 minutes to write your second essay. Be mindful. Try not to go too far past an hour. But like that did happen to me the last time I wrote um, essays. I spent a little bit more time on my first essay, kind of rushed through my second essay to get back on track. Then I was able to finish my third essay with a little bit of time to like go back through everything. So you know, there's different approaches, but you don't want to get to the situation where you're opening up your third essay and you are limited on time, you know? So I would try to allocate two hours to the first two essays and don't deviate more than like 10 to 12 minutes from one hour per essay because you want to write three strong essays. So we did this one in class. Oh, there's a chat. Um, where is this essay in the drive? Oh, someone asked, can we do the February 2023 one? I said, yes, we're going to do it. And someone's saying, where's this essay in the drive, the February 2023 one? Um, I ha we haven't updated the drive with the essays from last year yet, but we will add them. Right now, just Google February 2023 uh, Florida Bar essays, and it'll come right up, morning session. Um, but I'll, I, I can literally add it right after this class, the one. So we did this Chipco one, which was uh, contracts. Then we, we'll do this one later in life which was interesting. This was the most un-Florida like Florida essay I've ever seen, but I don't think it was extremely difficult if you knew Fourth, Fifth, and Sixth Amendment, um, which you should know. Oh, thank you, Lexi put it in the chat. And then this one I think was a very fair essay. This is the one where my student last time, she was a, a personal injury attorney in Connecticut. She got like 86 on, I think she crushed it. So there's a lot of points to get on this. All right, see, this one's a long one. Um, look, there's no model answer. We're going to have to do our best. So cutie, cater, cutie catering uh, was referred to your firm by a lawyer who works in another firm. Lawyer has proposed that your firm pay her 10% of any fees earned. Okay, referral fees. We're not going to discuss that. But she would otherwise not be involved in the matter. You can't do that. You have to have some sort of active participation. Even in, in real life, you think that doesn't happen at your law firm. On the bar exam, it must happen and it should happen at your law firm. You can't just refer a case and then wipe your hand clean. You're supposed to participate. Okay. Discuss the merits of potential tort claims by B against C and any arguments that C may assert. So that'd be my prong one, right? B, V, C and uh, defenses. Point two would be C, V, M. They told us defamation. So we know it's going to be defamation. Beautiful. I want to talk about defamation. And then ethical issues. That'd be prong three. So I like this, how this essay is. It's just a memo three prongs, and we can just put our points in. BVC and defenses, and then CV Miami Road. This one was given live in the flesh. So if you think these essays are crazy outdated, like you can't say that about this one. B and G were getting married. They hired QD, they hired C to prepare and serve food and beverages at the event. Betty told the company that none of the food at the wedding could contain peanuts because Betty's six-year-old niece had a peanut allergy. So what is that? We assume C assented to that. And what does that, re what does that represent? Express sure. warranty. That's an express warranty, right? You're saying there's no peanuts. You're literally saying that. Okay. Shortly before the wedding, C was setting up tables of snacks for guests at the ceremony. One of the tables had a plate with a variety of cookies, some of which were peanut butter cookies. 
Cutie Catering had inadvertently switched the cookie plate plate for Betty's wedding and the cookie plate for another event. So they inadvertently switched the cookie plate for Betty's wedding with the cookie plate for another event, right? So they were setting up tables for guests. One of the tables had a plate with a variety of cookies, some of which were peanut butter cookies. They inadvertently switched the cookie plate for Betty's wedding with the cookie plate for another event. What does that sound like? Negligence. Negligence, right? Negligence. When Cutie Catering was setting up the tables, Betty's Aunt Martha arrived with a plate of cookies as a wedding gift. Aunt Martha was unaware of Nancy's peanut allergy and her cookies contained peanuts as well. Cutie's Catering employees allowed Aunt Martha to leave her cookies next to Cutie's Catering food. So what do we have here? Superseding cause or intervening cause? We have a lot of things. One, we have employee. When we see employee, what does that look like? Vicarious liability. Right, so we have responding superior with vicarious liability. We have negligence here for switching the cookie plate um, from another event, right? So there's probably peanut butter coming in here. Um, here we have uh, Nancy putting in a peanut butter cookie as well, right? So we have two scenarios of peanut butter cookies coming in, and we have negligence on the employer employee because that's going to be uh, you know, responding superior. And then we have an intervening or superseding cause of Aunt Martha putting in her own peanuts, right? A lot of negligence going on. Nancy then arrived at the wedding with her mother. While her mother was conversing with the guests, Nancy went over to the catering tables. Nancy ate one of Aunt Martha's cookies and one of Cutie Catering's peanut butter cookies, right? So, she ate uh, two of the cookies, right? Nancy ate one of the peanut butter cookies and one of Cutie Catering's peanut butter cookies, right? So that's causation, right? Like she ate the cookies and she's gonna get sick, right? Ceremony began soon thereafter. Nancy stood with her bridemaids near Betty during the ceremony. Um, and remember, uh, Nancy's a six-year-old with a peanut butter allergy. Nancy stood with the bridesmaids near Betty's during the ceremony. As Betty and George took their vows, Nancy had a severe peanut-related allergic reaction, just as we suspected. Her face swelled, she had difficulty breathing, and she collapsed. Nancy fell into Betty, who awkwardly sprained her ankle. Betty and her guests were terrified and paramedics were called. Nancy recovered after the paramedics gave. Nancy told her mother that she ate the cookies, which led to the discovery of the peanut-containing cookies from Aunt Martha and Cutie Cater. So what happens here? What, what claims of action do we have? IIED. IIED. No, or, yeah. Or N. Why do we have intentional infliction of emotional distress? Can you explain that to the class? It's negligence. Um, I don't know if it says it yet. Betty, something happens to the bride. Because maybe it is. Let me tell you this. If you're a, uh, a spouse, you're a bride, you're getting married, and any little thing goes wrong, that's IID and IID. It doesn't say it there yet. I think. Right, just trust me. This is your big moment. You you only get married once, twice, maybe three times in life. But your wedding is a big moment. And if it doesn't go exactly as planned, you're going to have IID or NID. It will cause you distress for life. So just the fact that they ruined your wedding is NID, IID, right? They ruined your oh. wedding. That's going to cause you emotional distress. You can argue that. What about Nancy oh. falling into Betty? What does that sound like? Battery. Battery, right? I don't think it's going to prevail because there's... Lack know, of intent. Yeah, lack of intent. But if you're falling into someone, we're thinking of battery. So we have tons of negligence going on with the cookie catering company. I argued, and does anyone agree with me yeah. here? Go ahead. I was going to say that in the paragraph above, the mother, the child's six years old, she has a peanut sensibility and she kind of like let her go get peanuts. So I don't know if that's vicarious liability. I don't know if Florida recognizes the parent child. That's an argument. That's a defense. Maybe the mother. As a defense, yeah. He definitely said that for a reason. While her mother was conversing with guests, okay, that could be negligent supervision as a defense. Mm. But we're talking about um, the wife versus the cookie company. The wife oh. is claiming that you ruined her wedding. That's her big claim. You ruined my wedding. 
And these are all the claims that I have. You made an express warranty that was a lie. You were negligent because you served me these cookies. In fact, I might say that maybe negligence per se, there's probably a statute on point that talks about food safety and you know things of that nature. I don't know. That's just like an extra point we could potentially argue. Some people I heard say they argued for strict liability, products liability. You know, I don't think that's the strongest argument in the universe, but I might put it in there that like maybe they can argue they put a defective product in, but la la la, that argument's probably not going to prevail. The better argument is a, a warranty claim, a negligence claim. Um, then we're going to talk about obviously the contributory negligence, you know, the contribution of Aunt Martha, whether that's intervening or superseding forces, right? Um, we talked about IID, NIED, and then um, you said maybe battery potentially, uh, and then all these damages. So who's injured here? Nancy's the one who's injured, but she's not the one who's making the claim. The claim is uh, Betty, right? So Betty is going to claim um, basically losses from her wedding, right? Like all the things that happened to her wedding, she's, her guests were terrified and they were called. There's going to be economic damages. You know, we can get in this whole thing about, you know, the negligence of the catering company under theory of respondent superior vicarious liability under theory of um, failure to warn or express warranties. And then just all sorts of foreseeability arguments, duty breach causation damages. Now, the second part of this, and this is something that we need to talk about because it's heavily tested. Why is it heavily tested? Because it's also tested in con law because it's First Amendment is the defamation. So let's get into this piece. The Miami World, a local news outlet, heard about the incident and posted a story on its website with the headline, Worst Caterer Ever, Cutie Catering Poisons Child Ruins Wedding. The story reported that Nancy collapsed because of food poisoning from spoiled ingredients or unsanitary food preparation conditions. What, what, what do we see here? No, I just press fair. Defamation. Definitely defamation. They told us it was defamation. But why do you say um, uh, slander per se? Oh, slander per se, yeah. Um, because it's a business. Right, because it's a business club about crimes, lowest and disease, women's chastity, or business. They said Katie Cutie Company is so bad. That's definitely per se. What else? Who published it? Newspaper. Newspaper. Miami Word. Miami Word. I thought it was Miami World. The Miami Word. Word up. Um, what do we know about newspapers and defamation? They have a privilege. Well, Maybe. like they can post um, about newsworthy events. That's a privilege to invasion of privacy, right? Like you don't have an invasion of privacy claim if it's newsworthy. That's not the same privilege that I'm getting at here with defamation. Does anyone know what I'm actually getting at? Newspapers? And it. Yeah, Barbara said in the chat about the 10 days to retract. Yeah, they have 10 days to retract. Exactly. Newspapers can, the Miami word has 10 days to take this back and be like, we retract our statement about QD catering. We had false information, whatever, whatever. Right. So, you know, that good defamation, you, you want to identify, you know, what is defamation, the intentional or the dissemination of uh, defamatory information to a third party that causes damages here. Damage will be assumed because it's slander per se be, or libel per se because it was written and it was in the newspaper and it's about their business, but they would have 10 days to retract it. You see, there's a lot of points we can get there. So QD Catering seeks advice from your law firm. QD Catering received a letter from Betty's lawyer threatening a lawsuit for damages. The letter argues that Betty has incurred medical expenses and lost wages as a dance instructor because of her sprained ankle, right? Can Betty uh, incur that? Um, Betty, oh, Betty's the wife. She got, she got a sprained ankle. Yeah, so she could definitely get the sprained ankle, right? And she could definitely get her lost wages as long as they're foreseeable. It also contends that she cannot audition for the lead role in a music production and has lost income because of that lost opportunity. What do we think about this? Uh, loss of future earning capacity. Do you think she's going to get this money? I don't think so. I would say I would argue it's stronger against no. Barbara or, or Lexi says no. Why do you think no? What's the argument for no? Because they're not certain. 
it's too speculative. I agree. It's for an audition. You weren't, you know, if you could show that you were likely to get it, like, you know, you were the lead contender and it was all, it was just about putting pen to paper, maybe, but here it's a little bit more speculative. Again, we can argue either way. Betty is distraught after seeing Supper ruin her wedding. I already knew this was coming. So what does that mean, distraught? IIED or I, NIAD. For sure. So um, they refer to you, and then obviously we talk about the ethical issues. So for here, the torts claim, I mean, the big one is going to be the negligence, right? And the responding superior and um, the uh, failure to warn or the express warranty theory. You might be able to get into negligence per se or strict liability. Um, products liability, but you know you argue to and from that. But at the end of the day, you can talk all day about how they had a duty not to serve peanut butter cookies, and they breached that duty, and they're responsible for everything that comes around. Now you say cutie catering, they're going to re respond and say, "No, this was Aunt Martha's fault. She dropped the plate. Well, there was two plates, and you should have prevented her. You shouldn't have let her drop the plate. I think that's going to fail too. And then, oh, it was um, the mom's fault for not supervising the kid. And eh, I don't know, like. It's a kid at a wedding. Kids are going to eat cookies. Um, I, I think all those arguments will fail, but those are, you know, potential defenses. And then the defamation claim, we got into it being a newspaper, 10 days to retract, it being liable, it being liable per se because they're a business. You know, a defense might be because it was truth, right? They might say, you know, they did poison the child. And we're like, you know, if there's, they, they collapsed because of food poisoning and spoiled grease, but it's not true, right? Unsanitary food, it was just because of peanut butter. So, you go back into that um, defamation case, but key is recognizing the libel per se argument and the 10 day retraction argument. And then the ethical issues we talked about 10% fee. Anyone, especially who did that question, have any uh, questions? Maybe things you missed or things you noticed this time looking at anew? It's not a terrible essay, right? I think you know that essay was very manageable. So today we've seen, we're gonna do one more. We've seen, three different types of essays, and they've all touched important things. Um, the first one was talking about products liability. Make sure you know that cold. The second one was talking about premise liability. Make sure you know that cold. And then this third one talked about defamation, something that again is heavily tested. So three really uh, highly tested torts, you know, defamation, uh, products liability, strict liability theory, and products liability. But then did you notice that all of those torts essays also had just regular negligence? You also want to be sure that you can write about regular negligence. NIED and IID were also very common. And then um, assault, battery, you know, false imprisonment. It hasn't shown up yet, but you want to make sure you have the other torts in mind. So let's do one more and we'll call it a morning. Um, like I said, I encourage people, if you're taking the MBE to come to my class at four, we're going to be doing Con law, federal con law, could be fun. Um, let's look at uh, one more essay. Does anyone have any questions about any of those main topics so far? Um, products liability, uh, premise liability, or defamation? No questions? We're all, all going to, when we see those. Uh, issues on test day, we're gonna do really well. Cool. So in the folder, we can go to materials and we'll do torts and we'll look at one more essay. What's a year that is very important to anyone? How about 2010? 2010, I was, uh, I went to the school at Tulane University in New Orleans. So it's probably doing things that I don't recommend doing. All right, what should we do with this one? Well, I already see nuts, guns, and all this. This is gonna be products liability. You know, in the, in the nature of time, instead of just going through it like this, let's just kind of look at the, at the issues that were discussed in this one. And we'll do that with maybe another one. So they talked about a procedural issue, you know, who they could sue against. Um, you know, they, they talk about this at the beginning, pure comparative negligence. We're talking about modified comparative negligence and who they could sue against. You know, that's not super important. 
Here, breach of warranty. This is another product's liability one. They uh, would have a claim for breach of warranty that the packaging you know, warranted something that wasn't true. An express warranty is a warranty that represents the basis of the bargain and describes the use of goods at issue. Here, they made a statement that just wasn't true. Um, they also will bring the implied claim merchantability or implied warranty of fitness for a particular purpose. Um, warranty of merchantability states that when sold by a merchant, the product will work as intended. So you see how their definitions are much shorter than the other products liability one. Um, a particular purpose in which she needs the product and she expressed such purpose, the purpose in the store knew of such purpose and the product did not work for that purpose. Same things. So they talk about uh, fitness for a particular purpose and merchantability. Um, they may bring a claim for fraudulent misrepresentation, express warranties uh, about the wood. Then we had fraud misrepresentation, so a claim for fraud and misrep. Um, you know, they made a, a false claim. That's a misrepresentation. There has to be actual damages for misrepresentation. Um, negligence, duty breach, causation, damages. So whenever there's a product's liability case, there's also contemporaneous argument for negligence. And here you can have damage for pain and suffering, economic damage, emotional stress, and also punitive. We talked about punitive three times compensatory, 500,000. You see, very repetitive. My goal is to make these essays as repetitive as possible. So you're just writing the same thing over and over. And then here they did the strict liability, products liability. They're both merchants. Um, the products are reasonably dangerous, manufacturing defect or design defect. They're, they were argued as a design defect and there was a reasonable alternative design that they could have implemented and that you know they'll make their argument. Um, it was outweighed by the profitability. That's the balancing test, right? Profitability versus safeness. Um, notice about this design defect, more plausible way to design the product, um, that it was in their control, it remained in their control, and that it was foreseeable use. So they go through the whole product's liability argument and then talk about even if they're found fully liable, they might be able to recover under indemnification theory from you know someone upstream. Uh, strict liability, they're liable, right? Notwithstanding knowledge, intent, et cetera. And then battery, see, they're always like an extra claim for battery. Here, there was a nail gun, the nail hit their forehead. They thought to bring a battery claim, right? The intentional tort. They could argue that, you know, there was a battery here. Um, at the end, you know, they would argue that they know we sell a product that will cause harm is intentional. So if it's, if it's substantially certain to cause battery and they sold the product, they could be liable for battery. They're going to defend that, you know, um, that they impliedly consented, but that's probably going to fail. So maybe a battery would prevail here. So this was another products liability case about a nail gun. Again, reinforcing products liability. I don't think that um, products liability is necessarily easy, but I think it's something that we should be uh, able to encounter and, and write a strong essay. Again, here, this seems like design, manufacturing, sales, it's gonna be another products liability case, right? You see strict liability, products liability. I'm not gonna go through that one, but that's certainly indicative that they do a lot of uh, products liability. Let's see, this one was from 2020. It was contracts and ethics. I think I even assigned this one, but what did the torts end up being here? It was all breach of contract, breach of contract, intentional interference with the business relationship. Um, a claim for this tort requires an existing contract. The defendant knew or had sufficient knowledge to know with reasonable certainty that the contract existed and intentional interference with the contract that causes the other party to breach. So this was intentional interference and then defamation. Defamation is an actionable tort, which arises when the defendant makes a defamatory statement concerning the plaintiff and there's publication of the statement. Um, here they talked about defamation. We talked about libel um, and then slander per se. And remember, slander per se is going to be the club acronym, acronym crimes of moral turpitude, loss of disease, women's chastity, or about a person's business. They do an IIDED claim in this one. IID requires extreme and outrageous conduct, exceeds all bounds of decency in society, knowledge or reasonable expectation that the conduct would result in emotional distress of the plaintiff, and the plaintiff must actually experience emotional distress. So this one, you know, some of the torts were IIED, um, intentional interference with the business relationship, and defamation. So that one was combined torts and contracts. 
Um, I don't know if we did this mega mark one. Um, again, you see employee, employer, you see puddle. This is very similar. Like you see these business invitees, uh, premise liability comes up a lot in torts. This is definitely a premise liability one, right? Um, duty to warn, a cause of negligence. Remember, it's premise liability. It's just a negligence argument. They had a duty, they breached the duty, actual approximate cause and damages. They had a duty to periodically inspect the aisles for dangerous conditions. It's the same thing, like the banana, the ice cream. Um, you definitely want to know about uh, trespassers versus invitees and what, what different duties are owed and things like that. You see they're always talking about um, pure comparative negligence. You're the first group of people. I've been doing this test since 2017 now. You're the first group of people where I'm teaching something different, but they're still going to test it that Florida is a partial modified compared to negligent state. Here they talk about IIED again. Um, and then they brought up, uh, you know, maybe defamation. Yeah, because people heard them shouting and defamation is a publication of facts. So that's why I always talk about the situation where my neighbor comes outside, throws the rock at me and yells, Ibis prep sucks. That's so many torts right there. Assault, battery, trespass to land, NIED, IIED. Um, defamation, because maybe my neighbor heard him say it, and then slander per se, because it was about my business. See, NIED, and then battery, they talk about. Um, battery is the intentional offense of touching of another without that person's consent. So, and then they talk about respondent superior, that comes up a lot, we've seen. Negligent training and supervision. Um, act as a reasonable person and train their staff and train their staff concerning the responsibilities of removing dangerous conditions in the store, negligent hiring, right? A duty to reasonable care in the selection of its employees. This person wrote the essay more how I would have wrote it. They threw the kitchen sink. They said, oh, you know, there was an employee who didn't clean up the puddle. He probably was improperly hired, improperly trained. And then they talked about damages, economic, non-economic damages, lost wages, past, present, future, medical costs, pain and suffering. Um, the six weeks of lost damages are recoverable. Punitive damages, we know, three times compensatory, 500,000. You see how I can just rip through these essays and identify the, the things that they're testing over and over and over? It's getting so repetitive that's like, you know, I pull up an essay, what do I even think they're gonna test about? Oh no, they're testing about the same thing. Couldn't you believe it? Premise liability, someone walking into a cellar, employees, right? It's the same things over and over. So when you, step one is identifying what these things are over and over. I try to do that for you. Step two is becoming confident that you can uh, write about them, right? Um, so they had a duty to patrons to keep the public areas of the premises safe and to warn patrons of any dangers. Um, public invitees, reasonable investigations and maintain this premise in good repair. Um, they're going to talk about trespassers, so the defenses. The seller was off limits and he was intoxicated. Um, owner might argue that the door at the top of the stairs was clearly marked employees only. He did not have permission to enter. Um, therefore, he was a trespasser and had no duty to warn of any dangers. Owner probably would not be able to reflect responsibility on the owner because owner saw Duke head to the cellar door and did nothing to stop him. Right? This is an argument about was the person a trespasser or was it an invitee? Even if it says no trespassing, but you know, an employee said, oh, yeah, go that way. That's probably in VT. They should have known. So here we talked about um, this person actually wrote the right thing. They wrote the wrong thing in 2004, but they wrote the right thing in 2023 that if you're more than 50%, you're not entitled to recover. So they got that part. Tavern keepers owe a duty not to serve minors and to protect patrons and to serve, not to serve known drunks. Fair enough. No duty to rescue, right? You don't have a duty to rescue. But like I said, once a person decides to act, that person must act reasonably, right? You have to continue. So this situation, I remember, they were helping the person, but then they banged his head. Well, they can probably be liable. Remember the rescuer thing. Danger invites rescue. If you negligently put yourself in a situation and someone comes to rescue you, then you'll be responsible for their injuries, unless they're a firefighter or policeman under that, that rule. But if you are not negligent in putting yourself in danger and someone comes to rescue you, you're not gonna be liable for their injuries. You have to be negligent in putting yourself there. Um, Florida's Good Samaritan rule does not hold rescuers liable for their negligence. Fair enough. 
Um, Florida's Good Samaritan Rule extends protection to emergency doctors. It protects ER docs so long as their conduct is not reckless. So that's good to know. Um, and then mitigation. We always want to talk about mitigating damages. I know we started class off today with a super long essay. Remember, it's 4,000 words. But you want to see something? Here's a model answer. How long was this one? Eight hundred seventy-five. That's the shortest essay I've ever seen by far. So you know, as much as I push everyone to write these two thousand word essays, just it is fair enough that they've given a model answer that's eight hundred fifty words. You just really have to make sure that you're writing all the issues, you're spotting all the issues, and writing all the rules and doing the analysis. I mean, at the end of the day, you can only write as much as you can write. Um, let's take a look at one more just quickly, and then we'll call it a, a session. I think we haven't seen this one yet from 07 yet. Maybe it'll be something different. I feel like these essays have been so repetitive that you should all feel confident that you can write about products liability, you can write about premise liability, you can write about defamation, you can write about different types of negligence, and then of course you can write about the intentional torts. So here, uh, speed limit, you know, toddler, I'm just seeing some words that are jumping out to me, right? Uh, forgetting to lock the vehicle, that seems like negligence. You know, working at a place that seems like responding superior, 15 years old, that seems like a duty, but is this kid going to be driving a car? Then he'll be held to an adult-like standard of care. Three years old, we're talking about a duty. Um, the mother, oh, the SUV hit the toddler. Was the mother work? Was the mother responsible? Was the kid responsible? Poor toddler. Um, Jimmy disappeared. The mother had experienced occasional anxiety and difficulty sleeping. Can anyone tell me why that's an important sense? What do you automatically know that implicates? An IED or? Right, uh, uh, distress. You see how my goal is to train you all to be like me. When you see these essays, you can quickly just be like, they wrote this to tell me that. And I know that I'm going to have to do the analysis. So here, we'll look at the claims of action. It seems like it's going to be some negligence. Um, he found a set of keys, so the, the kid drove off in the vehicle, and then he hit a kid. So there's going to be a lot of intervening, superseding, responding superior, 15-year-old kid, duties of care, negligence, 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 um, and I feel bad for this kid. So, right, the pure comparative negligence thing, There, a lot of them start off with this. I think that's fair enough to do. Start off with the, you know, modified partial comparative negligence, abolishment of joint several liability. We've limited punitive damages at three extra 500,000. You can get all those points right away if you like. But then they get into the real thing. Negligent supervision. Negligent supervision, you know? Negligence requires duty, breach, causation, and damages. Vicariously liable for its employees, we call that respondent superior. Talking about foreseeability, foreseeability, foreseeability. You know, nothing too hard. Then the mom was negligent in leaving the SUV unlocked. Again, see elements of negligence above, um, right? This is a part I didn't know. Although a tough argument to make, it may succeed because in Florida, an owner of an automobile is liable to up to 100,000 any damages caused by his or her vehicle or being used for someone else. This is referred to as a dangerous instrumentality. This is a small rule that I did not, I couldn't have told you until right now. So, you know, don't feel like you need to know that rule, but that's just, important dangerous instrumentality so he owed it they're saying that argument is weak he was a foreseeable and you know they'll be able to collect damages um maybe the sheriff they're talking about sovereign immunity here we'll talk about that in con law but foreseeability negligence it's all negligence so far talking about comparative negligence and how we're going to analyze it and then damages three times or five hundred thousand, and then nied do you see this one? Extremely short essay, just really talking about negligence. There was no issues here other than negligence, vicarious liability, and um, foreseeability and such. So I think what today proved more than anything is that there's not that many torts that they test, and they test them over and over and over, and you just want to become confident in being able to write about it. And then no matter what tort they test, there's always the, the conversation just about personal injury in Florida. Like, what's the limit on punitive damages? What type of contributory negligence state are we? And do we recognize joint and several liability? And then intervening, superseding forces and foreseeability, actual proximate cause. I mean, there's so many points to get 
on these torts essays that are just, do you know torts? Then it's about identification of particular torts. Like you see the words and that jumps out. Oh, that must be battery because there's offensive contact. That must be IIED because, or NIED because she's losing sleep and that's, you know, emotional distress. So I hope today was valuable. Thank you.